get the all right, so on behalf of Arrow, we thank you for joining today's session as part of Expo 2020. We want to offer our community a chance to do just that, check in on topics that are important. Uh, we've titled our conference Catching Up and Looking Ahead um, so that we have the opportunity to connect with one another uh, as this year of disruption comes to a close. This is Arrow's first virtual conference, so thanks for your patience if we encounter um, any bumps along the way. Expo is free this year and we welcome contributions of all sizes. Uh, if you would like to help sponsor our event, please make a contribution at arrownt.org slash donate. I'll go ahead and put that in the, uh, the text box so that everyone sees that and can access that. So we'll, we'll go ahead and begin by just going over some of the basic features of um, the Zoom um, platform. And so uh, next to your name, you will see a microphone and like a little video. The microphone, if you click on that, it'll have a red line that goes through it. And that just means that you're muted. And we'll have you go ahead and just make sure that you are uh, muted while we're doing the uh, presentation so that there's no video feedback. And I just made you co-host there, Andrew. So Andrew is going to be, Andrew Valenus is going to be presenting on um, some renewables that are currently um, available in Montana. Um, he is the executive director of MREA. Um, so would you like to introduce yourself, Andrew? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, uh, fellow Andrew. And um, thank you to Arrow again for, uh, for having me on uh, yesterday and today and just kind of allowing me to participate in the expo and, and support the expo. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, and I'll say again today, Arrow and MREA have a long history of, of collaboration and partnership and being supportive of each other. And um, we're really excited to be participating in the expo. Um, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here to get a couple things started um, really quickly. Can I, can I interrupt you real quick, Andrew? Yes, yeah. Um, on the chat box, if we could have everyone that's viewing this video right now, go ahead and type their name and their affiliation just so that we know who they are and who they're associated with just to kind of um, get to know each other. Great, okay. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, uh, and while folks are doing that, I'll just give a quick intro to MREA. Um, the Montana Renewable Energy Association, uh, it's an organization founded in the year uh, 2000. We've been around for about 20 years and um, we are a hub for renewable energy education and advocacy in Montana. So we do a lot of presentations, community events. We engage with students, um, with, you know, adults interested in renewables, um, our elected leaders, of course, the Public Service Commission, um, and we work statewide to, to advocate for renewable energy. Um, so what we're going to do today and what I was asked to do today uh, is to walk um, our, our viewers here through a couple of our videos from this past summer. Um, in light of everything going on with the pandemic and COVID-19, we couldn't host our regularly scheduled Montana Clean Energy Fair. And so instead what we did was we put on a, a lunchtime presentation series called our Summer Series. And uh, we brought on a number of experts and professionals to talk about different technologies, um, different um, kind of innovative uses of renewable energy. Um, and then we recorded those and put them up on our YouTube page. So what I have up on the screen here is um, a shot of our YouTube page um, where you can see the 2020 summer series videos. And uh, we really went through kind of a whole host of topics. We ended up having 11, um, you know, everything from solar and micro hydro all the way to uh, agriculture on our national parks and transportation and, and how renewables kind of impact those industries. So uh, what we're going to do today is show the presentation on micro hydro systems, as well as the presentation on renewables plus agriculture. Um, they're about 20 to 25 minutes each. And what I'll do is we're going to show the first video. Um, and if you have any questions that come up during the video, you can submit them using the chat, um, the chat function. And I'll address those after the video. Um, so we'll do microhydro first, I'll address some of the questions, then we can do the renewables plus agriculture, um, and I can talk more about uh, other questions that come up during that video. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and bring up our first video here.
Oops. Sorry, I pushed the wrong button. Give me one second here. All right, I'm going to put myself on mute. And if I, I could get a, a thumbs up once the video starts playing to let me know it's coming through loud and clear. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrew Valinas. I'm the executive director of the Montana Renewable Energy Association. Welcome to beautiful Gold Creek. Uh, we will be talking today about micro hydro systems, one of which is housed right behind us in this little shed. Uh, I want to introduce our guest speaker today, Mr. Rip Hamilton from Solar Plexus. Thanks for joining us, Rip. Thank you. Uh, Rip and I are going to be talking about micro hydro systems, the different components, different considerations, uh, what to think about as far as where the water is coming from, and uh, really everything you need to know about these systems here in Montana. So Rip, why don't we start by uh, you just telling us a little bit about yourself and your, and your work. Yeah, uh, my name is Rip Hamilton with Solar Plexus. We've, uh, we're a renewable energy company, been in business for about 26 years, and st actually started doing micro hydro. So, um, you know, obviously there's not a lot of streams and micro hydro sites in, in Montana. So we branched out, cover about seven states with hydro projects, and uh, actually had to go into solar a little bit because there wasn't enough hydro around. So um, hydro is our favorite, but we do a lot of solar too. Great. Uh, well, I'm glad it's your favorite because that's exactly what we're talking about today. Before we dive into the system components, Rip, can you tell us a little bit about maybe some of the initial considerations people should be thinking through uh, before they want to invest in, in a micro hydro system? Yeah. So a lot of clients will call, in the, especially this time of year in the spring when we have high water, Everyone's seeing water running down every drainage there is, and they want to jump on and, and put a hydro system in. The, uh, the main consideration is how much water does that drainage flow in the off season. So we usually tell them to take some measurements and come back in you know August, September, October, and take some me measurements with the same devices they were using, it, whether it's damming up the stream, putting a small pipe in, using a five gallon bucket and timing it, or if it's at a culvert at a road crossing, you can get a pretty good idea of what the flow is. But the, the flow rates are so variable that it's critical that you get a good measurement during the low flow time of year. That's gonna be the baseline for how much power we can produce. The other critical element is the head. So the vertical distance from where you can take the water out on a, on a piece of property to where you have to return it to the stream. And that elevation is the other important factor. And there's some other critical things, distance the pipeline runs and uh, wire, wire loss from where the turbine is to your point of use. But those are uh, less critical and easier to overcome than the head and flow rates. So the head and the flow rate seems like those are really what you calculate to generate yes. the power. And, and a lot of those, it sounds like you can do kind of DIY measure at home with the help yep. of maybe your installer. Um, what about other considerations like electricity use for the home? Is that something you go over typically with the user? Yeah, we can. So given a, given a resource of water, um, the amount of water and the, and the drop, we can calculate how much power you can produce and more or less tell you what your limitation is on power before you're going to have to augment with a generator or with another source, wind or solar. Um, so s establishing that baseline and, and letting the client know that anything above and beyond that is going to have to be supplemented. So Rip, one of the considerations obviously for micro hydro is you have to have water on your property um, and water rights are, are an important issue. Can you talk to us a little bit about how some of those considerations? Yeah, so if the water is originating on your property and it's a spring, then the water rights process is relatively easy, um, meaning, meaning about a year process. If you have an irrigation right or an existing water right on the property, you can sometimes get it converted to a hydropower non-consumptive right. That process usually takes a little bit longer. Uh, if you have no water right at all, then uh, you have to make sure that the water basin you're in is um, open to new water right applications. 
And then you would also want to consider how where you are in line with other people's water right to make sure that you can ma uh, maintain that flow throughout the year. And where can people go to find out more information about water rights? The DNRC is the best place to check and you can um, find out where your property boundaries are, geocode or whatever, and then contact them to see if the basin's open or not. Great. So microhydro systems and their design can be really specific to the site that you're on. So Rip, can you tell us a little bit about this site and some of the uh, intricacies of how you design the system? Yeah, so this site is pretty unique in that it has groundwater, a nice groundwater spring on site. Uh, we were able to capture the water underground, so there is, uh, we don't have any filtration, we don't have to worry about leaves in the fall or anything like that. Everything's nice and clean year round. Um, and then the water travels 1,400 feet down a pipeline with about 120 vertical feet of drop on it and supplies the turbine behind us here in this powerhouse. Uh, other, other sites, we, we've installed catch basins with uh, different types of screen. Some have well, slotted well screen and others have, uh, it's called Coanda screen. It's a wedge wire that's fish friendly. Um, and, and there are some, uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks has some rotating screens that they sometimes use. We've used those in Idaho. Um, so there's a variety of options for pulling the water out and still protecting fish if there are fish in the stream. And some of that I imagine will depend on, like we said, this is a uh, ground source system. Um, some of the, the systems are surface water, right? Meaning right. probably what people are more used to thinking about when they think about hydro, which is water flowing down a creek or a stream. Right, so when you, when you are installing a, a system on a stream, the diversion has to be set up so you can let some of the flow go by to satisfy uh, low flow requirements for fish during the winter time, or if there's people with irrigation rights downstream from your, from your head gate. So designing that intake is fairly critical and um, it, can be, it can be a fairly expensive part of the project. So Rip, uh, talking about the size of these microhydro systems, about, about what size are we looking at with this system and what might somebody, maybe a typical customer need to help produce enough energy to cover their home, home energy loads? Yeah, so this, this system has about 1,400 feet of lineal pipe, 120 feet ahead, and we're running in the neighborhood of 100 gallons a minute. And we're generating about 600 watts continuous. So. The average Northwestern Energy home uses about a thousand continuous, but that's that includes a lot of heating load. So if you take away hot water heating, uh, your dryer, maybe some range, and you run all that on propane, 600 watts is more than enough to run the house 24/7. The bet, so we're supplying a battery bank, and in this case, a, a fairly small battery bank, uh, about 24 volts at 370 amp hours. Um, is a tiny bank for the house this size and it's pretty amazing and it's simply because those kilowatt hours are replaced every night and and this with the systems running 24 7. and you talking about one of the benefits of hydro versus solar for example or wind um, depending on the water source that you have hydro can run 24 hours a day right. seven days a week and the flow might change obviously throughout the year. We talked about a high flow season and a low flow season, but it's pretty regular power coming through, right? Right, so we're getting 600 watts. And even if we, if, we've got, if we had a really dry year and we had to shut a nozzle off and maybe we were down to 400, um, you wouldn't be able to run this house on a 400 watt solar array simply because you're down to 1.9 hours of full equivalent sun here and averaging about 4.4, whereas the hydro is 24 seven. Great. Um, and yeah, one of the very interesting and many benefits of hydro. Yes. Um, obviously it has its other trade-offs for sure, but right. um, that's one of the great things about it. So the water comes in and we hit this gate valve. That gives us the option to shut the whole pipeline off if we need to do any service work on the turbine. And then we have a second valve for irrigation and firefighting, a third valve to drain the system. If we shut the pipeline off up above, we can drain the whole system out the drain here without running the water through the nozzles. This valve shuts off all the nozzles to the turbine. This is a four nozzle turbine, so we have one, two, three, four. 
Right now we're ha we have two nozzles on, one and two, three and four are shut off. The water comes in, goes through the, the Pelton wheel, hits the Pelton wheel and spins it, turning the generator, creating the electrons. The water then drops out the bottom into this basin and then follows the drain pipe back to the stream. The electrons would go out to the combiner box where we're monitoring battery voltage and feeding power up to the house. And in this particular case, everything's 24 volt DC. We're watching the battery voltage with these two controllers. These are uh, diversion load control. So when the battery voltage climbs up to a point where the batteries are gonna become damaged due to overcharge, these heater loads will kick on and drag the battery voltage back down. The unique thing with a hydro system is that it always has to be on. It's not like a solar system where you can shut it off. So this always has to have a load on it. Therefore, these, these heater loads are critical to the operation of the system. This particular structure is nice because it just lays over. If we have to service it, we got plenty of room to work in here and access everything. Uh, some people will sink these in a concrete vault a little tougher, it's a little confined, but um, this is a really nice setup, the way this is laid out. Uh, so Rip, we just looked at the microhydro system uh, from the outside, the one that's hooked up and running. This is one of the internal components. Can you tell us a little bit about what this is and how it works? Yeah, so this is, a, this is an actual scaled down version of what we just looked at. This is a, um, the mini, the es and mini turbine. So in this, in this case, it's a one nozzle turbine. The water would come in and the pressure of the water would hit the Pelton wheel. And when it hits the, comes into contact with the spoons, it rotates it. And that rotation turns the generator, which creates the electricity. Then in, this, in the case of down below, we'd have the discharge below it with a pipe coming out. So this is the, the Pelton wheel or the Turgo wheel part of the turbine, depending on the brand. And like you said, this one is scaled down. This is um, uh, one input, right? Whereas the one that we just looked at had four different inputs for right. the water. This, this turbine would work best with low flow, really high head. So maybe head elevations of uh, maybe 300 feet and a flow rate of probably 10 gallons a minute, 15 gallons a minute. Okay, Rip, so we've walked through the system, we've looked at the different components. Uh, say we're a homeowner and the system is installed and it's producing energy for us. What are some of the next steps that we need to think about? Is there data monitoring? Is there maintenance required? Can you walk us through some of those things? Yeah, so when we install the systems, we typically install a voltage meter, a, an amp meter, so we can monitor what is going on at the turbine itself. And then obviously the, the voltage will vary depending on battery use, but it's, it's amps times volts equals watts. So you can multiply the two together quickly, come up with a number and know whether the turbine's operating properly. Uh, you need to watch and make sure that the screen on the intake is cleared. It, in this case, again, it's unique and, and that everything's underground and super maintenance free and maintenance free is always good. Um, every two or three years, you may have to change bearings depending on how hard the turbine is running. This four nozzle turbine is a little bit overkill on this site and would produce about a thousand watts under ideal conditions. Um, the homeowner doesn't need that much so they close two of the turbine nozzles and operate more closer to their needs. Still overproducing but not overproducing so much that the turbine is getting a bunch of unnecessary wear and tear. So turbine bearings, cleaning the screens, and um, just general inspection of everything occasionally is, is all helpful. Great. And then at that point, you're just producing some nice, clean, homegrown energy. Yep. Excellent. 24-7. Well, Rip, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your expertise. And thank you for tuning into our video. The Montana Renewable Energy Association has lots more information on our website at montanarenewables.org. We hope you will check it out, and we hope you'll tune in to another one of our educational videos in the future. Okay, um, thanks everybody. And lucky for you, you do get to tune into another one of our videos in just a few minutes. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, see if there are any questions about 
micro hydro and i should uh i should start by saying i'm much more well versed in solar and wind um but i'm trying my best to get up to speed on more micro hydro questions and answers so um if you have any questions please go ahead and submit them and i will try to address them um question here any issue with mineral buildup in the plumbing or the system um that's a really good question i you know i don't know you know, typically anything large, you know, this wouldn't really address minerals, but any kind of larger um, item would be caught by the screen at the intake before it gets put through the system. Um, for smaller minerals and, and things like that, um, I don't know, you know, that might be something where if it's running all the time, there might not be an opportunity for there to be much buildup. Um, you know, I think that'd be a, I'd, I'd love to follow up with you about that one, actually, see if I can talk to Rip and um get an answer for you but you know typically you get build up for mineral deposits and things like that when things are sitting still um you know if you think of like a boat for example sitting at a dock you know it gets stuff built up on the bottom when it's kind of sitting there um but in particular for, for a system like this if that water is continually blowing through uh and spinning the um the pelton wheels there um i don't know that there would be a huge opportunity for things to build up on it um, if there was, you know, you could always uh, service and clean it, um, something that your installer would be able to, to kind of walk you through. Um, let's see, another question. Is there any sense in trying this with seasonal irrigation water? Do I know of anyone doing that? Great question. I don't know of anyone doing that. To be honest, there aren't many micro hydro systems being used in, in Montana in general. Um, you know, I think there are solar and wind are certainly more popular at the large scale. Obviously, we have a lot of hydro um, in, in the kind of federal dams and state dams. Um, yeah, I don't know anyone using seasonal irrigation water. I, I think it might have to be really worth the trade off. Um, and I, I kind of assume, and please clarify if you'd like, I kind of assume you're talking about, you know, uh, irrigation typically um, you only get water served kind of in those certain months over the summer and using some of that water to power an irrigation pump. Um, unless you did something like trying to harness the runoff in a certain way, that's really helpful. Um, six months of use, right. Yeah, um, I think that's really gonna depend on the economics. Um, my guess is whatever you're paying for that irrigation water uh, is going to have to be probably much less than what you might be paying for general electricity in order to make the economics work. Um, but I'd have to I'd have to do some mapping math on that to see. Um, that would definitely be another question that would be great for an installer. I, I think there are a lot of question marks there that I'd have to look at. So I don't know if I could give you a kind of even lean one way or the other. Um, but yeah, that's a really interesting question. Like I said, I think it has more to do with what you're paying for the irrigation water versus what you would be maybe saving by using, by turning some of that water into, into electricity, especially if there isn't significant flow. Um, you know, your primary use is obviously gonna be to, to water your crops um, and, and your land. So um, yeah, I'd have to do more math on that one. Sorry, that's kind of a runabout answer, but, but it's a great question. I, I don't know of anyone trying that application yet. Um, is there a relative cost per watt or kilowatt compared to solar? Yeah, you know, that's one question that um, I didn't ask Rip during the video and I forget, I think we got to it in the Q&A afterwards. So I'd encourage you to go back to the video at some point and maybe watch the Q&A session that we had uh, during the summer series. I can't remember offhand, but I can get back to you. Um, I think it is a little less cost effective um, for the direct installation, kind of the upfront cost. Um, um, I'm, I'm sorry, a little more expensive, I think, than, than solar. Um, but the nice thing about micro hydro is that because you get 24 seven power from it, you can you know get a good amount of production out of it. So again, it, it's kind of these different levers that we always talk about pulling with the economics of, um, you know, what's the upfront cost? How much are you producing? How often are you producing? Um, you know, even with solar and wind, it's the same thing. It's, it's you know, what is, your, what is your resource and how often can you produce and how efficiently? 
Um, let's see. Uh, Mark is asking, oh, Mark's trying to stump me. Let's see if it's outside my expertise. Um, don't have much head, but there's a lot of flow. Any options to take advantage of that flow? Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, I think one of the things Rip talked about, and, and this kind of goes back to my levers analysis. Um, you know, when you look at these things, especially something like renewable energy, um, you know, it's it's at, at the end of the day, you can you can simplistically boil it down to a math problem, right? You need head and you need flow. And in order to get a lot of energy, you want to maximize those two values. So if you have a lot of flow but not a lot of head. You can still get a good amount of energy production and vice versa. Um, you know, I think as as Rip alluded to, there are different types of um, turbines, different types of um, the actual mechanical system that's better for one situation or the other. Um, and so I think there are definitely options there, and and it's certainly something to consider. What I thought was really interesting about the system that we looked at um, was that it was off grid. Um, and one of the great things about microhydro and the fact that it runs all day is that you can, you know, probably more effectively power an off-grid system, uh, like we talked about, because your your battery bank can get recharged overnight. Where with solar, you know, you certainly can't power the battery bank overnight. With wind, you probably can. Uh, wind actually blows a little better in the mornings and evenings and overnight. Um, the trade-off with solar, of course, is that you probably won't have to use the batteries as much during the day because you're getting that bright that bright sun and, and the production there. So again, those are all trade-offs to consider. Um, and, and each just, you know, it doesn't necessarily make one technology better uh, than the other, but it might be more effective for your particular situation. Um, but yeah, Mark, I, I would say you definitely have an opportunity there. Okay, let's see. Um, Unless I missed one, I don't see any other questions that came in. Um, if you do have another one, feel free to submit it. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and get us started on the second video. And uh, I will take more Q&A after this video. So here we go. Sorry, really quickly, I want to jump in um, and just uh, explain to folks. So, so the video I showed earlier was um, a pre-recorded session, obviously, that I did out in the field uh, with Rip from Solar Plexus uh, and Installer. Um, this next presentation was just a, a live Q and A and a kind of a PowerPoint-based presentation that we did with um, Stacy Peterson from the National Center for Appropriate Technology. So it's a little bit different format. Um, and I actually didn't host this one. Our uh, intern, Evora Glenn, did. Um, so uh, just a heads up, those are uh, kind of the, the folks in this video coming up. Um, so I'm Stacy Peterson. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction, Evora. Um, and I am the Energy Program uh, Director at the National Center for Appropriate Technology. We're a national nonprofit uh, that works in sustainable ag and sustainable agriculture um, and sustainable energy. Um, and so we're very interested in agrivoltaics, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So a brief uh, overview of what I'll talk about today. I'll go over first what the concept of agrivoltaics is, uh, then a little background on um, why they are great, and then talk about some applications and then talk about the AgriSolar Clearinghouse, which NCAT is working on developing. And then I'll provide a list of resources uh, that you can click on. If you, if you want a copy of this presentation, just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll send it your way. And then we'll open it up for some questions. So agrivoltaics uh, is a term used to describe the co-location of solar and agricultural operations. They can be directly over or surrounding and adjacent to uh, the agricultural operations. It can be a farm or a ranch. It can also be pollinator strips or pollinator areas. Um, buffer lands work great for this, uh, conservation lands, and then processing operations and farm worker spaces are also great places to co-locate uh, solar and egg. Bit of a background on this. Um, 
this picture shows a large scale solar development. And often what happens in these big, big solar developments is they go through and they grade the land. And they do this just so they can, you know, have a, a good efficient use of the space for the solar development. But in doing that, they're removing all of the habitat and they're removing the pollinator spaces. And they're often replacing agricultural lands or residential lands. And um, when I look at this picture, I see this huge potential for synergy. You, know, you see a blank canvas around the solar panels. There's places that we could be putting pollinators or beehives, or we could be growing crops, uh, we could be grazing animals, things like that. So there's this huge potential there for uh, a synergistic use of space. Um, as a part of that, there's a, there's a pushback right now that's going on. Um, these articles are just showing some of the pushback of people that are going against large solar developments, particularly in agricultural areas. They see it as a competitive use of space. Um, and they're, they're pushing back, especially um, in areas where they've got a real eucolic landscape. Um, they don't want to see these big industrial looking solar farms. And so agrivoltaic goes uh, to try to answer this, that, to show that it's, it's not going to compete against the agricultural space, it's going to be part of it. So some more benefits beyond that, um, there's a diversified revenue stream that can occur because of agrivoltaics. Um, in addition to your crops or in addition to your livestock, you can also earn money um, from a solar developer that might lease land from you or you can generate the power yourself. Um, you can reduce your energy costs because of that. There's also uh, additional funding sources when you, when you bring ag agrivoltaics into play. You can get funding from the USDA for this from, from an agricultural perspective, or you can get funding from the US Department of Energy is another place you can go. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, and then I'll, I'll give some links to places that you can look for those. Um, there's also tax and utility incentives, uh, not necessarily in Montana just yet, but there are some nationally. Um, there is an opportunity for habitat preservation. There's also a good bit of water conservation that occurs, and so we have some increased soil health. Um, there's a potential for season extension, and there's also a great opportunity for shade. So there could be shade tolerant plants or shade for your workers, um, lots, of, lots of good shade underneath those solar panels. And there's the reduced land use competition, and then importantly, um, maintenance and damage to the panel is decreased when you bring these crops in. Um, if you look at the, the one in this photo here, we've got a vineyard, um, and that is greatly decreasing the need for mowing or for dust suppression that might damage the panels. So one example of an application of agrivoltaics is pollinator strips. And these are strips of land um, underneath or around a solar site. And they're planted with deep rooted plants and grasses, flowers typically. Um, and they try to use native uh, plants and flowers as much as possible. And these capture and filter the water. They help build topsoil and they increase soil health there, therefore. And then critically what they're doing is they're bringing more habitat for pollinators, for bees and for butterflies, insects and birds. And then these pollinators are pollinating the surrounding farms. So it's really beneficial to farming operations. Um, and also, if you look at the picture down on the right, uh, there's, there's a lot of beautification that occurs with the flowers and with the pollinators. And people that are, you know, like there's been larger uh, solar developments that have shown that they're going to do a pollinator strip when they install this. And they're, they're having much more acceptance of the, the people that live in these areas when they can show that it's a, it's a beautiful installation that they're doing as opposed to a decimated landscape, like I showed a couple slides ago. So another pollinator option is beekeeping. Uh, this is an example of a solar apiary in Medford, Oregon, and it was installed by Pine Gate Renewables. There's 48 uh, beehives there, and then they've planted pollinators all around and under the uh, solar development and it's pollinating nearby farms to great success. Farming uh, is, a, is a great place to um, co-locate solar and ag. You can grow shade tolerant crops underneath uh, the panels. Uh, you can grow um, things that need a little bit of season extension. You can have some frost protection. Uh, you can look at this as a solar energy crop and a traditional crop. 
Um, like I mentioned earlier, you can also lease to solar development companies and, and, and get revenue that way. Um, there's wind blockage and erosion prevention from the solar panels. And then there's the increased pollinator habitat. Uh, it is worth noting that this doesn't work well with tractors. Uh, so it works better with crops that you would hand pick or hand harvest or harvest in another way besides tractors. Um, or you would want to set up your rack system so that you know they're spaced and you could get the tractors in between them. So site preparation. A lot of these ag lands um, have been tilled and graded. And so some of the, one of the larger costs when you're doing a solar development is, is this grading and flattening. And, and there's a lot of ag lands that aren't being used. Maybe they're conservation buffers. Um, that are already ready to go for these ground mounted systems. So it, it really is nice for the solar developments if there's lands like this that aren't being used for more than a buffer. Um, there's a great opportunity to come in and, and to put some ground mounted systems. So in temperature is another consideration where it's mutually beneficial to have co-location. The solar modules can shade and cool the ground and, and they can give some frost protection for your crops and keep them warmer at night. And then the crops in turn can keep that temperature a little bit lower and decrease the potential for heat damage to your panels. This also helps conserve water. Ranching is another great opportunity for agrivoltaics um, for grazing. Um, you can graze sheep work incredibly well underneath solar panels. The American Solar Grazing Association has really good information on this. We're currently working with a group called Helical Solar and they're developing a new rack system that works well with cattle for cattle grazing. So this is a great potential and oftentimes solar developers will um, pay farmers to, or ranchers to bring their livestock there and graze so that they're not having to mow anything like that with, with maintenance. Processing, uh, that's another aspect of agriculture that works really well with solar. Anything that's using an electric power um, can be powered with solar. Um, you can do your fans, your pumps, motors, lighting, electric equipment. There's also opportunities uh, for if, if you need to do off-grid cooling. So the picture down in the right is a group that we're working with called Ridge to Reefs and they developed this uh, for an application in Puerto Rico. A lot of the crops there um, it's very hot and humid and so they, they need to have cooling right away and they needed to have something that didn't um, wasn't they couldn't plug in really easily there. So they developed these off grid cooling systems and it worked out really well. So they're doing those around the country now. Irrigation is another great opportunity for agri solar. Uh, the solar can power irrigation systems for your crops. They can also power stock watering. Um, they can do the stock water tank heaters in the winter. Um, it's not irrigation, but fencing, electric fencing is also a great use of solar. Um, and then the picture on the right, if you look, there's the, the circular pivot irrigation fields. Um, those areas all around the non-irrigated corners, those are a great opportunity to put some solar development. Um, if, if there's nothing happening in those lands, that's a, that's a great use of those lands. Similarly, conservation lands are, are an excellent use of agrivoltaics. Um, there's quite a bit of funding available for this too. So I've put the links embedded in this so you can click in and see if, if your land is appropriate for this. Um, there's conservation buffers, prairie strips and pollinator strips are all available to get funding um, through NRCS and USDA. And um, it, this can fund all the way up to 50%. So it, it's really worthwhile uh, to look and see if, if you can apply for this, if, if you're going to do this with your operation. Um, so in a lot of operations around the country, there's a great need for farm and ranch worker heat relief. One of the leading causes of death of farm and ranch workers is heat stroke. And that's a completely preventable death. So uh, there, you can use the panels themselves a shade or you can use a system like the one um, I've developed on the bottom um, and that's like a portable cooling system that I'm hoping that we can develop through NCAT to help farm workers and ranch workers uh, at least cool down a little bit during the day so they can get that heat stroke risk down. Um, 
a lot of states are bringing in shade laws now. California and Texas have shade laws now. So I think as that happens, there's going to be a greater talk about shade and the necessity for shade in agricultural operations. And, and solar will, I, I hope, play a big part of that. So this is a, a new thing that NCAT is working on. Um, because we work both in the, sp the spaces of sustainable agriculture and sustainable energy, uh, we would like to help the two sectors talk. And we want to become a national information hub for agri solar information. We want to help solar developers talk to farmers, help consumers, talk to technology companies, and really be an information hub for everybody. We want to help develop best practices, um, do key research, and, and work with all of our partners. Our partners are there on the right. Um, we've got a great group of folks that's working with us. Um, Argonne National Lab is working with pollinators and what grows well underneath the panels. Uh, Center for Rural Affairs is helping, helping us uh, talk to different rural markets and figure out where solar development can work best with agrivoltaics. The Fresh Energy Center for Pollinators is doing great pollinator work all around the country. Uh, George Washington University is working on policy for this. Helico Solar is the group that I talked about previously that's working on the racking system for cattle, for cattle grazing. Um, you all know Montana Renewable Energy Association if you're here right now. Um, the Oak Ridge National Lab is doing research into the best uh, crops that can grow under and around solar panels and then looking at pollinators. Uh, uh, Ridge to Reefs is another group that I talked about earlier um, that they're working on sustainable energy and sustainable egg. Um, opportunities, um, particularly in insular communities like Puerto Rico and Hawaii. Cita Sisla is doing research at, Pal at Cal, Poly, Cal Poly, and she's looking into what grows best, um, what type of water um, is needed, information like that, what grazing works well underneath solar panels. We're also working with the Smithsonian um, Conservation Biology Institute and their Virginia Working Landscapes to look at solar on their farms there and um, how it works in their landscapes. And then Wexis Technology is developing some really interesting technology um, to monitor the water and the soil health and then the solar production that occurs in an agrivoltaic operation. And then here's some resources uh, that might be helpful. Um, I know this was a really high level overview of agrivoltaics, so I thought I'd, I'd give some links to places you could look um, the Solar Grazing Association is a great source of information. NREL has quite a bit of information, um, particularly the document that's highlighted there. USDOE also has quite a bit of information. And the INSPIRE project wiki is really interesting. They're consistently doing great projects all around the country, and they um, update that really frequently. The DESIRE database is a good place to look if you're looking for funding or tax incentives. Uh, we have a couple links for a few more of our partners there and then links to how to look for funding through USDA um, for the pollinator strips and the conservation lands. So go ahead and stop sharing here so you can start answering questions or asking questions. Excellent. Thank you, Stacey. Really appreciate you sharing that. Okay. Um, well, thanks again, everybody. Um, that was our, our kind of short, shorter but overview uh, presentation about solar and agri-solar and solar plus renewables. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, although clearly, as we saw in the video, uh, Stacy at NCAT is the expert, um, but, but happy to answer any questions about agriculture and solar, um, or if you want to back up and just generally ask any questions about renewable energy, I'm happy to talk about some of those. Um, maybe while some of those are coming into the chat, I'm just really quickly going to bring up um, a page that I showed yesterday as well, um, which is just uh, MREA's installer directory here. Um, this is something that MREA hosts to help people connect with local installers in their area. So. If you're interested or, or in need of finding a local installer, you can go to our website, montanarenewables.org, and click on this installers tab right at the top here. Um, and it'll give you an interactive uh, display that you can click around um, and look at all the, you know, find an installer near you. And then down here, we have all the contact information as well um, so that you can be in touch um, 
you know, with all of these guys. So um, I hope that's helpful for folks. And uh, like I said, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, if there are any hanging out there. Well, Andrew, I don't see uh, any rolling in, which which I again assume means that uh, Stacy answered everyone's questions before they even knew they had them. Um, but of course, if more come up, I'm happy to touch base with folks and uh, encourage you to reach out to us or to NCAT, um, or of course, folks at Arrow uh, to answer any questions you may have. All right, well, thank you, Andrew, for presenting. Um, and I'll go ahead and just uh, ask uh, anybody who was here to go ahead and look at the other uh, presentations that Arrow is going to be hosting over the next couple of weeks and go ahead and register for those. Um, I guess if we don't have any other questions, we can go ahead and end on that note. And once again, I thank you for being available here and giving your time to Andrew for this presentation. Hey, uh, really quick, Andrew, sorry, before you log off, um, I just thought, you know, Stacy put up a ton of links at the end there. Um, if anybody watching the video is interested in getting those links, um, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, my email is just andrew at montanarenewables.org. And um, I'm happy to send the slides along so that you have those resources so you don't have to try and look them up. Perfect. Thank you, Andrew. Um, this is Robin. <laughs> Um, I, I, I have a quick question. I couldn't, I'm not being successful typing fast enough, but um, Andrew, do you know, um, do you have any updates on, on the installations that are happening in Montana on AgriSolar? Is there any place that, that from your conversations uh, with the folks at NCAT that maybe someone could go see to get a better sense of what they look like here in Montana? Great question. Um... Not that I know of, um, and, and I'll certainly shoot Stacy an email and ask. Um, I, I don't know that there are any large projects or any kind of, um, you know, case studies that are going on right now. You know, there may be some kind of informal ones with somebody who put, you know, some ground mounted solar on their farm or ranch or something like that, but I'm not sure. To, to my knowledge, there was nothing like set up as kind of an agro solar um, project uh, mm -hmm. or anything like that. But I, I think that's the hope. And particularly with the partners, you know, that what's nice about NCAP being a national organization is that they have these offices in different states around the country where I know they're hopefully going to make some inroads to have different pilot projects and case studies, um, you know, from around the country that you can kind of compare and, and look at. So I, I'm hopeful that with some of the Montana partners they pulled in and having the headquarters here that um, we'll get some really cool projects in Montana in the next couple of years. I, I think that's part of the vision, but but I, uh, I didn't write the grant. I just got uh, kind of tacked onto it. So I will certainly push in that direction. I think it'd be really cool to be able to, you know, when we're allowed to socially gather again, um, you know, get some busloads of people out there and, and take a tour of it. I think that'd be really cool. That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. And um, yes, thanks, by the way. What's that? And yes to the links, it'd be great to get those links. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and let's see, Mark, I saw you submitted another question here. Um, potential for large scale solar in Montana um, isn't much activity as there should be. Well, I couldn't agree more with that uh, sentiment. Um, yeah, th there's a ton of potential for solar in Montana. I mean, that's the great thing about Montana. So we have the, let's see, depending on who you ask or which study you're looking at, we either have the third best or fifth best wind resource among the states um, because it just whips down off of the, the mountains and out across the plains. Um, and then for solar, we have about the 25th or 26th best solar resource. Um, despite that, I think we're 49th or 48th for uh, solar installations per capita. So, you know, not, not living up to our potential in that way. Um, our, our long summer days give us a lot of opportunity for solar potential particularly at, at utility scale. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of untapped potential that, that we're not using and um, we hope to see more of it. You know, I think consistently when you ask um, solar and wind professionals across the country what the biggest barriers are right now for the industry, it's all policy and regulations. Um, you know, the technology is there, the workforce is there. 
I mean, solar and wind installer have been two of the fastest growing uh, jobs in the entire US economy, uh, like number one and number two for the past number of years, um, just completely outpacing the entire rest of the economy. So I think all of the pieces are there. We just need to kind of lift up the floodgates a little bit and, and you know, let the let the technology do do what it can do. Um, Andrew, this is Robin. Uh, along those lines, the barriers is is one barrier in Montana that relative to other states, our power or you know electricity or whatever is cheap. It, 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 is that relevant or not that relevant to the topic? It's absolutely relevant. Yeah, no, Robin, and absolutely. Um, you know, when when you look at any kind of technology, it's like anything else, right? If you're going to install, you know, um, a better roof or whatever, or install any kind of energy efficiency, you know, appliance or anything, you look at kind of the cost trade-off of what you're going to save versus what it's going to cost to to purchase. Um, you know, like buying a fuel-efficient car, right? If it costs more, but it saves you more on gas, you know, what are what are kind of those trade-offs? And energy is no different. I think now it's still an issue, but maybe less so than it was a number of years ago. The reason being technology has gotten more efficient and the cost of the technology has dropped. Um, I know growing up in, when I grew up in Rhode Island and was going to college out, uh, out there, you know, New England is pretty much powered with natural gas. Um, that, that's just the dominant resource out there. And it's more expensive than other electricity sources. So for New England, switching to renewable energy made more economic sense because of their cost of power. Montana has relatively cheap power nationwide, but regionally compared to other states in our region, it actually is more expensive at some of the highest. Um, so there's kind of those trade-offs too, um, but it's definitely a factor and in, in something, you know, we were talking about micro hydro earlier and, and how those economics kind of play off of each other. Um, the cost of electricity is, is certainly a big deal. Um, in fact, that's why, you know, because we have relatively lower electricity rates compared to other places in the country, um, doing something like installing solar at your home or, or farm or ranch, and then switching your heating system or your water heating system from natural gas to electric can actually be a really great way to, to make a long-term financial impact. Um, you know, we're seeing this a lot, right? Everybody's moving to electrification of everything because electricity is a little cheaper than natural gas. Um, and then you can power it with solar as well. So you, you get that trade-off too. A um, couple more questions popping up. This is great. Um, you know, there's so few of us. If folks want to unmute and go ahead and ask their question, that might be, if that's okay with our facilitators, I think that might be kind of fun. Um, so let's see. Uh, oh, this one is just submitted by Arrow. So I don't know which of which of the Arrow reps submitted it, but a question about hybrid systems, um, accommodating variable water flow rates, day lengths, and wind availability. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't seen many hybrid systems in the in Montana yet, but we're starting to see more of those across the country and, and certainly internationally as well. And what that most of the forms that I'm seeing are uh, solar and wind combo systems. And in particular, you know, you could say a different kind of hybrid would be solar plus storage or wind plus storage as well. But we're, we're definitely starting to see solar and wind uh, systems kind of co integrated. Um, sometimes through similar inverters. So the technologies are, are literally tied together, um, even into the same inverter going into the home. Um, you know, I, I think one of the key things that allows that technology to work most efficiently is just the timing of your resource. So before you install solar, you know, we all know when the solar resource is going to happen for the most part, right? Sun, sunrise to sunset. Um, with wind, it's, it's not quite as easy. So typically what you do is try to measure the wind on site for at least about a year actually um, to get a full 12 month calendar cycle of what your resource looks like. And what, what they're measuring is um, how strong does the wind blow? From which direction does the wind blow? Um, is there turbulence in the area? Um, they look at kind of what your seasonal, what, what's called seasonal variance. So, um, you know, farmers and ranchers are probably familiar with this term, but seasonal variance, right? Does the wind blow better in the summer or the winter or the spring or fall um, and kind of get that together? And so ideally what you would love to have from a renewable energy perspective is um, a wind resource that picks up around dusk and blows to some extent overnight. 
And then if it drops off in the morning, uh, then you have your solar resource that picks up. So you have that kind of 24 hour cycle. Um, and that's not uncommon and unheard of, you know, typically, especially I know living on the coast, for example, you get land breezes and sea breezes uh, in the morning and the afternoon. So it's a really well-timed cycle. Um, and to an extent you get pretty predictable um, daily variants from wind over the plains as well as, as the you know, day heats up and hot air rises and cooler air drops, um, you get those natural cycles. So these are all things that have a, a good amount of possibility for sure. Um, let's see, uh, with the aforementioned wind potential, yep, does mounting the solar panels up on a metal structure above pasture create additional challenges and what would that cost look like? Um, good question. So um, it, I, I wouldn't necessarily call them challenges, but there are certainly considerations. So if you're gonna ground mount solar, um, you do have to have a foundation. You do have to figure out what height you want them at, um, especially if you're going to um, pair it with agriculture or ranching you know, um, opportunities, then you really wanna look at you know, what height, what spacing, and, that, and that's a lot of the stuff that um, Stacy was talking about that they wanna do more research on is what kind of height and spacing do you need um, in order to, to make that system more, more efficient. Um, the, the, the issue, for example, to consider with solar uh, is you have to be careful of shading with solar, right? If you put shade onto a panel, you're defeating the purpose and it's not producing as much. So if you have two panels that are kind of, you know, mounted on the ground like this facing the sun, as soon as you elevate one, all of a sudden the shade profile gets longer. So if you elevate them, you also have to space them further apart so they're not casting shade on each other. And so to, you know, to have a system that's mounted higher, you're gonna need a greater footprint of land, um, which may actually may or may not synergize well with whatever you know, crop or, or um, you know, animal that you're, that you're using that land to, um, or that land for. You can, you can tell I'm not up on the farming and ranching terminology. Um, but you know, there are considerations there, but, but there are also synergies, I think, like, um, like Stacy was talking about. Um, let's see. I think Mark was bringing up an answer there. Um, let's see, is installing an agri-solar system more accessible than installing a wind system? Um, Ooh, interesting question. Um, I, I, I don't think I could say one way or the other. I think it really depends on your situation. You know, more accessible, I guess it depends what you mean. You know, the cost of solar per kilowatt right now for a small scale system, um, based on the energy production that you get in Montana is probably, is, is a better bang for your buck. Um, you know, if you have a really good wind resource, if you're in central or eastern, northern Montana, um, that might not be as true um, if your wind really whips. So accessible as far as, you know, financial, it's going to depend on your situation. Um, accessible as far as technology goes, um, I think even then they're, they're probably pretty comparable. You know, I think you have fewer options with wind turbines because they typically come in, you know, one kilowatt or five kilowatts or at the larger scale, you know, five megawatts, three and a half megawatts, one megawatt. Um, the nice thing with solar is it's sort of like a bit of a Lego set. You know, if you want 750 kilowatts, you know, you can use, um, well, 750 is pretty big. I, I meant um, um, seven and a half kilowatts. You know, let's use a 10 kilowatt system, for example. That's gonna be about, you know, 10 or 12 solar panels. And if you wanna do just a little less, you can just remove a panel or a little more, you can just add a panel. So you can really kind of, um, design the system to meet your your more precise needs. Whereas with a wind turbine, they come in, you know, I think fewer um, uh, sizes. So, so that makes it maybe a little more challenging for that consideration. Um, as far as finding installers, um, especially in Montana, I'd say it's pretty comparable. Um, you know, a lot of the folks doing solar in Montana also do wind. Um, I think there are a lot of folks in Montana that only do wind actually. Um, and, but a lot of folks really do do both. Um, I would say in Montana, most of the installation firms do solar just because that's what's been most popular here. Um, but they're certainly well-versed in wind technology and, and how to install it. 
Um, Andrew, could I say something about that? Please, yeah. Um, we we have a uh, a small wind um, system, a, a Bergy ten kilowatt system at our ranch, as as well as solar that we put in last year. Uh, and as I mentioned in the chat, they're really complementary. Um, however, it, we have been facing an increasing difficulty with finding wind technicians to, to work on it. Um, you probably know the folks we have now, um, um, Logan and uh, Jenny, um, his last name is, is escaping me right now. Um, they were in Great Falls, but they've moved to Florida. They come up once a year and, and they help us out on our system. Um, if, and they're thinking about retiring and if they do, they said, well, there's somebody in Wyoming and somebody else in Minnesota that might come out to work on, on our system. But it's, um, it's, it's because I think there are so many advantages with solar, it's getting more difficult to find people that um, do much with, you know, kind of this moderate sized small wind kind of system. Yeah, thanks for that, Mark. No, that that's something we didn't talk about. You know, the, that was touched, that rip touched on during that micro hydro video. Anything with moving parts, you know, is going to require more maintenance, right? So, micro hydro, um, wind, obviously. Um, that that's the great thing about solar is you put the panel up and you really don't have to do much. Um, you know, the inverter might need replacing after ten to fifteen years, but um, the goal and the intent and the likelihood with solar is that you know, you don't even have to push the snow off of it if you don't want to. A lot of people do. Um, for the most part, you can just leave them there. Um, even in an agriculture setting, you know, depending on the angle that the panels are set at, you're looking at agrosolar. Um, a lot of times, so the, unless there's a lot of snow on the panel, like inches and inches, um, if there's a thin layer, the panels will warm up and the snow will actually start to melt and then typically it just slides off. Um, so you don't even have to really go out there and worry about that. Um, you know, with wind or micro hydro, there are moving parts that you have to consider maintenance for. So, um, yeah. And, and Mark, I, I think I saw you responded. I, I hit you privately with a couple recommendations for some folks to talk to. Um, I, I would be, um, a, a little upset to find that, uh, that we couldn't get you a local installer, come help you with your wind turbine. I, I know a few folks, so let's see if we can help you out with that. But, That's good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see, a couple other questions coming in. Yeah, Coulter, so you're asking about vertical axis wind turbines. Um, and for those who don't know, so typically what we see for wind turbines are what are called um, horizontal axis. So the, the um, you're thinking of, you know, if these, if my fingers are the blades, you've got the, the kind of rotor that it spins along, right? And that axis that it's spinning on, that's a horizontal axis. With vertical axis, uh, A-X-I-S, uh, with a vertical axis, you've got the, you know, the, the pole essentially that they're spinning around up like this. And you typically see them as kind of paddles um, that, that spin around, you know, this way. Um, I, I don't have a great reason for why that top technology hasn't taken off more. Um, I think there may be more, um, you know, I've seen some really interesting wind turbine uh, designs that are different than the kind of typical three blade uh, horizontal axis. There's the vertical ones. There's also some, I don't even know what to call them, kind of circular ones um, that, that kind of rotate around. Um, I, I'm failing to find the word to describe it. Um, I'd have to look it up to figure out what they're exactly called. But um, I think the efficiency and the familiarity of that horizontal axis design from, you know, even just um, windmills back in the day, you know, that that's kind of what works and what's proven. Um, I think if, if that technology can get to the point where the efficiencies are better, then it's going to be worth it. Right now, I think one of the nice things about one of those vertical axis um, turbines is that you can maybe put them in kind of more urban settings where space is more of an issue. You know, for a horizontal axis, you've got these big turbine blades and the longer the blade, the more surface area, which catches more wind, which means you can produce more power. Um, and your, your swept area, which is the description of the 
entire area that the blades sweep, you know, when they're spinning, um, that can be really big. That diameter can be really big. For something like a vertical axis, you know, you could, you could have it really skinny, but really tall. It's more of a rectangle versus that big circle. And so, you know, you might be able to put that, for example, I think the University of Montana had one here in Missoula for a little while. Um, I'm pretty sure it's still out, but they may have taken it down. Um, but they had one and it was just kind of sticking up on campus. And, you know, it was pretty non-intrusive as far as the view shed goes. Um, and uh, yeah, like you said, you know, if you can keep some of the technical parts on the ground too, that makes maintenance easier for sure. You know, with large scale wind turbines um, and the horizontal axis, all of those gear ratios are up in the cell, you know, 100 feet off the ground, um, which makes, you know, uh, that's, why, that's why they pay wind turbine technicians um, pretty good wages to climb up there. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of, I think they recruited a lot of rock climbers to work on uh, wind turbines because um, they're used to, you know, hanging 80 feet in the air off of a rope. Um, so there's your fun. If you didn't learn anything today, hopefully you learned that. I'd be curious also for like do it yourself options, given that like wind turbines can run off of permanent magnet alternators. So with a permanent magnet alternator, it's essentially something that is a technology that's been around for a really long time um, and are very easy to maintain and that there's very little maintenance at all. And so with something like that would be something that would be scalable in smaller lo local areas without having to worry about the upkeep or the initial investment in that. And so I know that as this industry is moving forward, more and more people are moving towards the permanent back alternators as a solution to the actual geared mechanisms for wind turbines. And so effectively, we could see wind turbines would have lower maintenance required in the future. And a lot of people are even building them now. They're, they're things that we have access to or are better off if we're currently using. I mean, anything that, that reduces the maintenance requirement, uh, I think is going to be a big, um, a big kind of momentum builder for even more uh, wind development. I mean, we're already seeing a lot of it, you know, especially at the utility scale across the country. Um, but, but those are the big, you know, some of the drawbacks, um, which, you know, a lot of things take maintenance, right? But if you're comparing it to other renewable energy technologies and thinking about, um, you know, how to, how to drop the price, um, you know, that's those efficiencies are part of what you're looking at. And especially the scalability. I mean, again, if you, if you kind of do a, a quick Google search of just innovative wind turbine designs, I mean, they've got some interesting ones for, I, I mentioned urban landscapes um, where they've got some interesting, you know, you've got like a building, for example. So this is the roof of the building and this is the side of the building. They're designing wind turbines that can just hang off of the side like this. So that when the wind is blowing down a street, imagine like Main Street in New York City or Fifth Ave, um, that wind essentially is forced into a wind tunnel and gets, you know, shot upwards up along these buildings. You can catch those updrafts and produce energy that way. And you know, the efficiency. I haven't, I haven't followed up on those designs in a number of years, but um, these interesting applications and these efficiencies are, are really taking things to new levels. Um, and you know, I think that's what we need more of. To be honest, I mean, putting more money into research and development and these innovative designs. You know, I think that's what's going to really help. Um, move this market forward. So I, I hope that continues. Even things just like agri-solar, agri um, you know, and looking at just different applications for the technologies that we already have, um, in addition to kind of new applications and new efficiencies are, you know, I think both are needed. I think another interesting that I just learned of recently was like a water breaker bind. And so the water break turbine was something that was developed um, quite some time ago, but it was brought back into application around the same time of Aero's founding um, as a result of like oil embargoes. And so people who were very dependent upon fossil fuels were actually using these wind turbines to heat water. So as the, as the wind turbine would, would spin, the uh, resistance of the water within the rotor shaft using blades was actually used to heat up water and that was then used to heat structure. And so I think that also just looking at um, these renewable resources in alternative ways and how we're actually defining them now, not necessarily just producing electricity, but also ways that we can um, find alternative ways to use them. So for example, like 
heating water or using solar hot water to heat water as opposed to using electrical considerations because that's more um, sustainable given the fact that there's less moving parts and there's less maintenance overall involved with them. Yeah, well, I mean, it can be. I mean, the, so first of all, I fully agree with you. Um, and I think, you know, I actually, I have a board member who, um, who uh, teases me a little bit that I don't talk about solar thermal enough and, and they're absolutely right. Um, you know, it's another great technology. It doesn't produce electricity, but it's certainly a renewable technology and makes a significant impact on your home, right? Solar thermal, geothermal, right? All of these technologies that are doing kind of this more passive heating versus direct electric production. Um, I think those have a huge role to play. And it's a shame that I think geothermal isn't more cost effective because we have an incredible geothermal resource in Montana in particular. And I know I've, I've actually been, I've got a couple calls that I need to make um, that have been on my list for a few months, to be honest, to kind of look into some companies that are doing more with large scale geothermal development to see, you know, how, how we can start to move those conversations forward. Um, Cause I think they are really important. You know, the, the trade off with something like solar thermal or geothermal, um, again, the, the nice thing about solar panels is they just sit there and produce electricity. Um, you know, when you add plumbing to the equation, you know, you've got pipes, again, you've got moving parts, whether it's water or some kind of, um, uh, some other liquid or fluid that you're using to do the heat exchanging, um, you know, there are moving parts there to consider, but, you know, that doesn't mean you need to write off the technology. Um, and, you know, if you look even more basically um, at just, you know, stepping away from renewable energy a little bit in the technology, I mean, even just passive solar design, which isn't really generating electricity or heat, but just using brick, you know, using windows and lighting to bring light into the home, you know, there are ways you can create warmth and heat without even generating anything, um, right? And so, you know, that's why we talk so much about efficiency and building design and renewables all in tandem with each other, uh, because synergizing all of those is really where you get the biggest bang for your buck. Uh, let's see, Coulter. <laughs> Coulter. Yeah, that's a great comment. Um, I'm, I'm, Chuckling just because it's uh, it's sort of an unfortunate reality, I think, uh, with everything going on. But um, yeah, you know, I think the the drilling rig isn't uh, the sticking point. Um, but you know, I would just love to see more of that technology get discussed. I really would. Um, you know, I think the first time I was introduced to geothermal was for things like baseboard heating, you know, um, or or you know, uh, floor heating. Um, that's not the word for it. I'm, it's escaping me right now, but. Um, you know, all these passive heating designs, radiant heating, that's the word I can think of, um, radiant floor heating and, and things like that. It's, you know, it's incredibly efficient. Um, it seems really cost effective, um, but, but the technology just isn't quite there with the upfront cost yet, yet, but hopefully getting there better and better. Mark, um, can you, in, in five words or less, can you explain what an organic Rankine generator is? Uh, it, yeah, it's sort of like a, um, sort of like running an air conditioner backwards. Oh, so you, okay. instead of running an air conditioner to move heat away, you use heat to, to turn the, the uh, turn a turbine basically on, on the, um, on the organic uh, Rankine generator that would would drive a and would drive a generator. I see. So, um, I I think there's concerns about uh, deposition of salts and um, metals and so on in in the plumbing of that kind of thing, and I think that may be part of the reason that hasn't taken off. But uh, there's a lot of potential uh, in places like the Gulf Coast and probably in Montana as well, where we do have a number of abandoned wells do something like that. That's great. Thank you. Hmm. Do we have any other questions? Um, I'll just chime All in right. and say 
thanks for the conversation. Um, it sounded like we were going to kind of wrap up early and then that got, to, <laughs> got into some really fun conversations. So thank you all. That was great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Andrew, once again for presenting and uh, being able to lead that conversation following the presentation. Um, so if anybody else is interested in any more presentations that Arrow is going to be hosting, you can go ahead and register for those and uh, we will see you then. Thank you for your time. Thank Thanks. you. Bye now. Thank you.